and we're going to start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll stand with me. So before I dive into a uh, little script here about conduct during our meeting, I want to remind everybody, whoever parks underneath the library and the underground parking, we do validate for that. So if you did park under there, please let staff know. We have staff here. They can raise their hand and we will give you a validation for tonight. So this is just a, a standard script that we have. We'd like to welcome you to each of you to our city council meeting this evening. We appreciate that you have taken time out of your day to attend our meeting to participate and see your local government at work. To start the meeting, we have laid out some guidelines for decorum and civility to make sure people feel comfortable and safe to participate. Please be respectful during other people's comments. Avoid cheering or jeering because it could cause someone to feel intimidated. Please also help to take care of this historic meeting room by not standing on the furniture or leaning against decorative pieces. If you have a sign or a prop or other piece of equipment, please make sure that it does not cause disruption or block other people's views. Also, items like sticks and dolls are not allowed. Please do not approach the dais, which is this area up here where the mayor and the council sits. Um, if you have something, you can hand it to council staff and they'll bring it to us. Our staff is here to help you. If you need assistance or have any questions, please raise your hand and a staff person will come and help. Also, we recognize that two minutes of comment time may not be long enough. To get all your thoughts outlined tonight, please visit our website or refer to a contact information sheet by the speaker cards for information about other ways to share your comments with the council via email, phone, or mail. Uh, we're going to dive right into looking for approval of the meeting uh, minutes for Tuesday, February 12th, 2019, Tuesday, February 19th, 2019, as well as the formal, meetings, uh, formal meeting minutes for March 5th, 2019. So moved. Second. Uh, a motion's been made by Council Member Fowler and a second by Council Member Mendenhall. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. We're on to item A5. We're going to turn the time over to the mayor to present the recommendation. Mr. Chair? Yes? Um, prior to that, um, point of personal privilege. Absolutely. Um, I, so the city council has received quite a few questions about ranked choice voting uh, since the end of the legislative session. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, what our position is going to be on this. Um, so when, when we first started talking about this as a council last year, um, we didn't have a lot of time to put a lot of public education effort into it. Um, there was concern at the time because with a mayoral election and with city council elections, starting, you know, switching up the process, you know, for an election that had already begun in, in many cases um, was something that we were a little bit concerned about. So the legislature, this past session that just ended a couple of weeks ago, changed the law again, giving cities up until August 15th, I believe, or April 15th to make a decision on ranked choice voting. So one of the, one of the, Things that Salt, so Salt Lake County or Salt Lake City doesn't run it. We don't run our own elections. Um, we have to contract with Salt Lake County um, to operate our elections. Uh, we've found out that Salt Lake County is not going to be ready to implement ranked choice voting uh, in their election process, which means Salt Lake City would then have to find somebody else to manage and oversee our elections. Salt Lake City, uh, and this council in particular, has, has already, we've let out on a number of election related issues. We were the first major city to do um, mail-in ballots, um, at citywide mail-in ballots. We did that uh, during our last election cycle and the prior election cycle. So we are willing to move forward with uh, trying new things and especially something like ranked choice voting. However, because of the time frame uh, that we're in, uh, Salt Lake City is not, we're, we're not going to be pursuing uh, doing ranked choice voting this coming election cycle, uh, largely because of the number of candidates running for mayor. Um, change, changing up the process midstream would be unfair uh, to those candidates and campaigns. And so we are um, committed to talking about this as a council uh, for future elections. Um, you know, we, we 
appreciate the, the process, but in order for Salt Lake City to properly educate all of our residents about what ranked choice voting is, how you know, this change is going to benefit them, uh, is something that we would not be able to do um, as quickly as we're being asked to do. So that's the reason that the, the Salt Lake City Council will, will not be moving forward with ranked choice voting this election cycle, even though we are uh, interested and willing to have those discussions and make those decisions for future elections. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Luke. So we're going to turn the time over to the mayor, who will, she will present recommendations to the council regarding proposed community development block grant funding, emergency shelter grant funding, home investment partnerships program funding, and housing opportunities for persons with AIDS funding budgets. Mayor. All right. Thank you very much for having me here this evening. Uh, I'm pleased to stand before you and present a one-year action plan of funding recommendations for fiscal year 2019 and 2020. These recommendations reflect the funding that will be allocated from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to Salt Lake City through four grant programs specifically designed to address the needs within our local community. They are the Community Development Block Grant Home Investment Partnerships Program, Emergency Solutions Grant, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. These grants will produce nearly $6.5 million in funding to help achieve the goals outlined in both the city's five-year consolidated plan and the overlapping goals outlined in the city's housing plan, which is growing SLC. The 1920 program year represents the final year of the current consolidated plan. The recommendations before you have been arrived at after a considerable public engagement process and an extensive review and analysis of each application. I would like to note that this review includes past and current performance of each entity that applied, anticipated community impact, and alignment with the plan goals. The CDCIP and the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Boards, as well as myself, have evaluated the respective requests. This review has included the context of furthering the goals of the consolidated plan, the housing plan, and the immediate needs of our community. For the funding cycle, there were over $13 million of requests through 61 applications. And as I stated, we anticipate receiving $6.5 million in federal funding. While it is impossible to fund every application, I commend the invaluable service that each agency provides. Many of the agencies are here tonight, and to them, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for advocating on behalf of underserved and underrepresented residents. They may not have a voice and oftentimes are in need. And thank you for committing to help us build a city for everyone. The consolidated plan continues to serve as a tool to provide expectations to the funding recipients, as well as to hold them accountable for their role in shaping our community. Together, the boards and I have prioritized affordable housing. This includes rehabilitation of existing single family and multifamily housing, access to rental and home ownership assistance, and creating new affordable units. The recommendations also focus funding toward the most vulnerable in our community, including those experiencing homelessness, refugees, and residents struggling with substance use disorders. I want to recognize our Housing and Neighborhood Development Division staff. They work throughout the year to ensure that each phase, each project, and each program is compliant with all requirements, ensuring that the city will continue to be eligible for future funding grants. Thank you for all you do, Salt Lake's HAND team. 
I would also like to recognize the incredible efforts of both our citizen boards that inform this process. The two boards spent a total of nine weeks reviewing applications, interviewing applicants, researching and evaluating each proposal for funding. They are mindful about each dollar, their recommendations and the people who will benefit from these programs and projects. I am truly grateful and I want to say thank you to the council for your time and consideration as you review and make final allocations for this funding. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we're going to jump into the public hearing portions uh, and items B1 through B3 will be heard as one public hearing. So I have a couple cards coming to me. Uh, just so everyone knows, this is a grant application. These are grant applications. One is for U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, the other one is for Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. It's the Salt Lake Metro Narcotics Task Force. Also, the Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant. It's a Foothills Trail fit plan for Phase 1. And I have one comment card, and it's George Chapman. Come on down, George. Okay. The 21st South resurfacing grant proposal or application goes from 13th East to 7th East and it really does need more public uh, engagement. The community council doesn't know a thing about this and they should be involved in it. There's a big fight going on, 50% want a road dot, 50% don't want a road dot. The street does need to be resurfaced and fixed and the grant makes sec sense if you had gone to the community council first. So all these grant proposals, if they affect streets in a community council's area, I'm urging you to go first to the community council. I know the 300 West grant proposal didn't get picked up, but that was another one that should have gone to the community council first, so they know about it. They're clueless otherwise, and that's not respectful. Please go to the Sugar House Community Council and explain what you're trying to do with the grant. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Anyone else want to speak in regards to these three grants? Okay. Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing and refer items B1 through B3 to a future consent agenda for action. Second. A motion by council member Fowler and a second by council member Johnston. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that motion carries. We're on to item B4, which is an ordinance for 515 South, 400 East, rezone and master plan amendment. I don't have any cards. Does anyone want to speak in regards to this portion? Okay. Does, was the council member like to make a motion in regards to this before? I will, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I move the council closes public hearing and defer action to a future council meeting. Second. Motion by council member Mendenhall and second by council member Luke. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that motion carries. Great. This is an ordinance for regulation changes for open space and similar uses. I have one comment card and it is Ann Cannon. Hello, I am Ann Cannon and I'd like to offer my support for the Planning Commission and Parks and Natural Lands Trails and Urban Forestry Advisory Board recommendations to not allow in open space zoning districts the solar farms, the standalone restaurants and three and their attendant problems, public utilities blanket exception exemptions or the local police and fire operations. However, the update on the table of permitted and conditional uses districts, I hope, because I only have a copy of the 2017 version of definitions for open space, natural open space, and open space areas. 
so that all are involved. The definitions being so clear that in the management of them can be unified in their understanding of how these three areas differ. Then responsible agencies can implement appropriate expectations, enforcement, and education about each type. We need to really move on in managing our open space. I would like to thank all of you, I'm not sure how many there are, who have been involved with our open space issues since, since 2003, when the city first established the Open Space Lands Program. Those of you on the council, much newer, I hope you'll become involved in the greater depth and continue to support Time. and help resolve the challenges that having open space in our city requires. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Anyone else want to speak in re regards to the open space changes? Seeing none, council members, I look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we close this public hearing and defer action to a future council meeting. Second. A motion by council member Mendenhall and a second by council member Johnston. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And that motion carries. On to item B6, which is a conditional building and site design review zoning text amendment. And I do not have any comment cards. Is there anyone that would like to speak in regards to this? Okay. Mr. Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing and defer action to a future council meeting. Second. second. A uh, motion by council member Fowler and a second by council member Luke. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank the planning division again. This has been a, a long time coming. It's a great set of updates. It's probably not the end all be all of the CBSDR process, but it, I appreciate all the work that they've put in for a number of years on this one. I'm excited to support it tonight. Great. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that motion carries as well. We are on to the big ticket items this evening. The uh, first one we'll be discussing is uh, an ordinance in regards to congregate care facility zoning text amendment. So just a quick reminder, I'm going to call two names. The first one, please come up. Second one, be ready. Um, Again, no clapping, jeering, cheering. This is just an opportunity for you to come express your concerns or, or uh, whatnot. And uh, here we go. Lucas Timmins, followed by Therese Holt. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lucas Timmins. I'm currently a resident on Sherman Avenue between 11 East and 13 East. And I hope the council will sincerely consider my comments as a community member that has been and will continue to be impacted by the in-between. You undoubtedly have and will continue to hear from passionate community members who neither live near nor or are impacted by the in-between. This is not surprising given the outreach the in-between has been in vocal and encouraging volunteers to support its mission. I have spoken with greater than 50% of residents on Sherman Avenue on the western half more than any other TIB representative including city officials. That includes our elected councilman who was elected to represent her district and listen to her constituents. We are not against TIB. We understand it's a vulnerable population. However, we are against its modus operandi to serve a limited number of terminally ill as well as those merely needing respite. Respite, a term used interchangeably with homeless. These two cohorts are mutually exclusive. I hope the council, when assessing the material and understanding how rezoning will impact my community, I hope you consider peer-reviewed scientific literature. The research unequivocally demonstrates the population house at TIB has a prevalence of mental illness and a majority have criminal history. This is not my opinion. This is not anecdotal data. This is not quali data, qualitative data. This is fact, fact proven across the country, including faculty at the U. Rezoning changes will have a lasting effect on the safety of me, my family, my neighborhood, which includes residents that have lived there for decades. Near, nearby businesses, and most importantly, it will affect the next generation of residents that reside there and play in our streets. This neighborhood deserves better. 
One positive issue that this issue has produced is that the ability of my community to better know one another. We have become tighter. The loss of such a community due to TIB will be tragic. Again, this neighborhood deserves better. Thank you. Therese Holt. Followed by uh, Allison Leishman. Good evening. Um, i am just come from the opposite angle and I'm speaking to you today in support for the in between. I urge the Salt Lake City Council to reject the planning division's recommendation to change the Elemosyne facility to congregate care facility and instead to create a new land use definition for medical respite facility as this term more accurately addresses the programs, uh, programs like the in-between, the, terminal, the terminology is now recognized in state statute too. My name is Therese and I'm a new immigrant from Europe and a full-time volunteer coordinator at the in-between. I have worked with the British Red Cross dealing with very vulnerable adults for the last five years, including the homeless population. The UK has been looking to the US for years to emulate projects and organizations which provide medical respite and end-of-life care for the homeless, and the in-between is certainly a beacon in this field. Unfortunately, preconceived opinions that are not based on reason or actual experience are prevalent in our societies. The in-between is a safe place, not just for our residents, but also for all our staff and volunteers, and I can wholeheartedly vouch for that fact. We hold an orientation session which includes also a tour of our facility every Thursday from 12 to 1, and every last Thursday, every month, time 5.30 to 6.30. Thank you for showing up in support of the in-between and to our opponents. Come along and learn, and see, learn the facts and see how we work. Thank you, Ms. Holt. Appreciate it. Alison Leishman, followed by uh, Reverend Tom Goldsmith. I believe that's what it is. Hi, I'm Alison Leishman. I am a neighbor, and I am a, the new development director for the in-between. So I'm speaking to you from both sides. This is a fabulous facility. It is surrounded with love for people in our community who deserve our attention. They are the vo most vulnerable people in our community. They're critically ill, and they are terminally ill. And they're people we cannot leave behind. I don't care what neighborhood you live in. They are people, and they will always be people. The people at, all of the people that serve the, our clients at the in-between, our residents, come at them with love. I know they say that their safety concerns I've been there. I never, ever feel scared. I walk out of there with complete happiness every time I leave, knowing what amazing work we are doing in this community. And I, I'm not here to talk about the zoning. I'm here to just say thank you for supporting the in-between and to all, I, I beg you to always continue to support the in-between. As a neighbor, it's an amazing facility to have in our community. Thank you again. Good evening. I'm the Reverend Tom Goldsmith, uh, Senior Minister of the First Unitarian Church, seven blocks away from the in-between, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to just give a, uh, a slight um, nod to a an institution, a very humane institution that is serving a very vital need in our community. I am very familiar with the facility 
where the in-between now finds itself. The time when it was um, hillside rehab, I've been there for years, had many parishioners there, and it was a real hopping place. It was busy, cars going in and out, you couldn't park, you had to park on the streets because there was no parking available. Now it's like 180 degrees different. It's peaceful, it's calm, and I want to um, alert everyone who's, who's listening, especially you, that the, um, the, the, the neighborhood uh, has many of my parishioners who are all in, in full support, including I have a family that lives literally two doors down from the in-between. Uh, they are grateful that they are, um, that the in-between is serving such a vital need in our community. Think about how um, the imagination can run away whenever the word homeless is used. Immediately it's, it's crime, immediately it's drugs, immediately it's mental health. But just think about the clients who were there. They're dying. They don't have family. They are alone. They don't have friends. They are alone. There is absolutely no traffic around the in-between that could even remotely hint at, at anything criminal. Um, the, the folks in my congregation are in extreme support of the in-between. We hope it stays. We hope that the zoning will allow it to flourish because it serves a vital human need. Thank you so much. Reverend Steve Anderson, followed by Kim Correa. I'm the Reverend Canon Steve Anderson. I work for the Episcopal Diocese of Utah. I've been a priest in the Diocese of Utah for a number of years, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer. I often tell people that the holiest time I spend as a priest is with someone who is passing away. At that very moment, it's a dimly lit stage with only the person who's passing away into greater life and with God. If they've been rich, been wealthy, whatever they've done in their life, it doesn't seem to matter. The world of bills has all passed away. There's nothing else going on but that one person in transition. It's a holy time. Three years ago, one of the things I administer is a fund that gives small grants for medical expenses for indigent people. We received a small grant request for $5,000 to me in between. I was struck by the notion of indigent um, care and indigent hospice. And so after this small grant was approved, I went to visit the site. This day I'll remember, walking into that place, I met Kim Korea, and I was given a small tour and was led to some one of the small 12 rooms of the place they had at the time. There was a gentleman there who had been previously homeless, and this was the first secure and comfortable place he'd been in many years. He had a small comfortable room, he had a TV, and he had his dog on the bed with him. When this man passed away two weeks later, some of the in-between was holding his hands. He passed on to greater life. I became involved with this. I did many of the funeral services there, and I'm on the board of directors now. The mark of who we are as people and who we are as a community is how we care for the least of those. Um, how we could not support this, but actually encourage this, says something more about us than anything else. And I support this wholeheartedly with everything I have, and I hope that we do too. This is good for our community. This, this reflects well on us as people. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kim Korea, the Executive Director of the In Between. Um, so I stood before this council almost four years ago now um, with the vision to start a hospice for the homeless um, with a vision of a community where everybody has access to safe housing at the end of life, access to hospice care at the end of life, a vision of a community where everybody has a safe place to stay while they recuperate from an illness or undergo cancer treatment, um, a vision of a community of people who care for each other and take care of each other, um, a vision of a community that's grounded in love and not fear. Um, and I stand before you today having fulfilled some of those dreams with the help of hundreds of people and I think hundreds of angels that are helping me every day, the people who have passed at the in-between. Um, uh, however, there's still a lot of fear out in the community, um, fear with regards to the population of people who are experiencing homelessness, 
fear of people who have mental illness, people who are different. Uh, and maybe that's a difference of skin color or religion or background or uh, ancestry. But um, I still hold that, that vision that um, as a community we can come together from a place of love, not fear. Um, and all of us at the in-between, despite uh, things that might be happening that we can't control, we do our best to stay grounded in love and our core values, which are kindness, dignity, respect, compassion, honesty, and we recently added redemption because uh, everybody, everybody deserves a second chance. And I, we hear all the time, I want to die a good person, I want to be a good person. And uh, so redemption is very important for us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Matilda Lindgren, followed by Tammy, and I know it's Castle for something. Hi, I'm Matilda Lindgren. I'm the program director at The In Between. Um, I also was here over three years ago um, at this very spot when we were talking about The In Between, and there was a lot of fear and a lot of um, unknowns. I can say now three years later, three and a half years later, that we have maintained a program that is working with virtually no major incidents. Um, you know, just have the regular day-to-day -day stuff, but we haven't had any uh, major occurrences, any crime, any major police calls. Um, this is an important service that we're providing. This morning, I bathed the body of a 36-year-old man and called his 14-year-old daughter to let her know that her dad was gone. Um, this is the 16th person that I've done so far since June of this year. These are people that have nobody else caring for them, nobody that's coming to visit them, um, and some of that is their choices in life, but it doesn't mean that they deserve to die alone on the streets. It doesn't mean that they deserve to be sitting outside of the hospital hoping that maybe the hospital will admit them one more time. Hospital's not going to do that. There needs to be a place for these people to go, and um, that's the service that we're providing. Um, again, I just, I just can't say enough that it, it's absolutely necessary. These aren't, these aren't elderly people that are dying with us. These are young people. Um, William was obviously younger than most, but we're talking 50s. That's our average age. Um, and there's a reason for that. If we can have people coming in beforehand and having a, a short respite stay, that can prevent some of these deaths. Some of these people that are coming back to us and dying with us are people that have had continual health problems that have nowhere to go to recuperate from them. And it, it, it makes it virtually impossible to beat some simple diseases, something that would take us a few weeks at home to get over. So thanks for listening. OK, Tammy, and tell us what your full last name is so I'm not. Castle Fort. Okay, I was pretty good. Sorry, I was quick writing. That's my bad. I'm Tammy. I live a block from TIB, and I have read all the staff reports and testimony of this petition that has been evolved over the last three years. The situation evolves by the day, and now Kim Correa of TIB does not want this proposal uh, approved because it does not meet her mission to expand and grow her current population. The fact that it's not a hospice provider and has very few, between five to seven, so-called real hospice patients has long been settled. There is no medical criteria, but to trim, Kim tried to make one last week. Kim has given us a gift by outlining why she is a homeless shelter when asked the State Homeless Coordinating Co Committee for $500,000 from the H2H restricted account because she was over budget by $700,000 in five short months. We all know a homeless shelter cannot be at TIB's current location, but Kim tried to explain that away by saying, we're only a homeless shelter for funding purposes. The people who have played defense for this, fraud, for this organization should be embarrassed, but they are not. I will continue to call them out publicly, which includes Robert Gerke of the Salt Lake Tribune, who's part of their group, their Yimby group, because this is what mobs do. Gang up on ordinary citizens who express questions and concerns for their community. And they also think that they are the moral superior when they are not. A good idea, 
poorly executed is not good for anyone. The zoning changes might be okay as written. It's hard to tell. But what was asked and what has been discussed for years is that this change is modeled after the in-between. Nothing should be modeled after the in-between. It is a failed model financially and operationally. TIB's latest budget report says every resident costs 4,500 per month. The Sarah Daft House operates on less than half that amount. Examples of security issues at, CI, at TIB are outlined in my email, which includes the number of 911 calls to TIB for mental health issues and assault. One of TIB's performance measures is a reduction in 911 calls. TIB cannot measure that, but that's Time. just one of those things you should throw in to add to your purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and your handwriting is good. A lot better than mine. Robert Goodman, followed by Dion Nielsen. Thank you uh, to the council. <clears throat> uh, as you all may know at this point, uh, I'm in support of uh, more inclusive uh, zoning and um, addressing the current housing crisis. Um, yeah, I've been a volunteer at the uh, various uh, local nonprofits for for a few years now, um, and uh, I just appreciate uh, the in between as well as um, uh, the council's efforts uh, for more inclusive zoning and uh, its efforts to be uh, more compliant with, uh, as I understand it, uh, federal law. Um, uh, to share a personal story with you, uh, <clears throat> see it. I've had uh, uh, a mother and stepfather uh, die of cancer, and um, I remember uh, checking my mother's uh, voicemails and uh, receiving uh, messages from Kaiser Permanente, as well as Sally May on uh, student loans, and um, I. I would like to share with you that a uh, terminal illness isn't affordable for some. Um, uh, this is my home now in Salt Lake City, and uh, I, I would like to live in an inclusive community uh, that accepts everyone from all walks of life uh, through one's lifespan. Uh, thank you to the council. I think so. yeah. Hi, Andrew. My name is Dion Nelson. You may remember me from the last time I was here for the same reason. <clears throat> Just the same as any other homeless shelter, the in-between is a compassionate and needed service, just like all of them. They all are. I'm pretty sure that everyone here agrees with that. But the in-between should have never been allowed to open on Goshen Street in the first place because it is a homeless shelter, and there isn't anything wrong with that, except homeless shelters are not allowed in the institutional zone. This is about zoning and where you put them. You guys went ahead and broke zoning laws and allowed them to open anyway, because I see and I get what you were doing. You're trying to come up with creative ways to house homeless because of the massive mistake that was made to build three shelters short of, what, well over 500 beds? So I get it, and it needs to happen. So do it where homeless shelters are allowed, and we'll all be supportive of it, but not smack dab in the middle of neighborhoods that homes are butted right up to them. It's not fair. You're ruining my life. I am very concerned about the zoning change and how it will again negatively affect my neighborhood and others in institutional zones. You want to stick de facto homeless shelters in them, remove the cap, and use conditional use? Whose conditions? Can they be mine? Are they Kim's? I don't trust anything labeled conditional use modeled after the lies and manipulations used to illegally open the in-between shelter. Also, the number 25 is not arbitrary. It was rounded up number that would be the people living on that street if similar single family homes were built there. It's a number that would have allowed a neighborhood to take on a homeless shelter. Yes, let's please call it what it is so that we all know what we're dealing with. 
but keeps it relatively small and manageable. It was not, however, meant to allow the business to call itself however many different titles to get 25 more here, 25 more here, 25 under Time. congregate care, 25 under Ely Mawsonary. Time. You need to find a better way to write this than just seven or more for shelters in the IZO neighborhoods that all have homes right up to them and schools and churches. Please keep them small. I will accept another shelter in my backyard if it's small, but not a no cap. God only knows how many. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nielsen. Sophia Anderson, followed by Dane Johansson. My name is Sophia, and I live two blocks from TIB. I am in opposition to any amendment that would allow organizations like the In Between be allowed to pop up in any neighborhood in the city. It is a city mandate to protect the integrity of neighborhoods. Homeless shelters cannot be in institutional zones. It is extremely concerning to me that members of the city council have looked for ways to circumvent the law that helps protect, protect Salt Lake City residents. TIB is a homeless shelter that cloaked itself in the facade of it being a hospice for the homeless. Nobody would be against a hospice for the homeless. However, Kim runs her building like a home and fails to acknowledge that she is dealing with an at-risk, unmanageable population. She has said all homeless are not criminals or drug addicts. That is true, but most are, per the U of U report published last year. At TIB's previous location on Goshen, they had an advocate in their city council person, LaMalfa, who brokered a 25-person cap on TIB to lessen the negative impacts to the neighborhood. District 5 has not been afforded that same advocacy. Our city council person has been an advocate for TIB. Erin said at the Elpco meeting in May of 2018 that she had no idea that TIB was moving into the neighborhood and that she would hold them accountable. A week after opening, she was arm in arm with Kim. There are a dozen people from the area who have been outspoken about their concerned with TIB. Aaron has not spoken directly to any of them other to say they are legally here, allowed to be here, and there is nothing you can do about it. Aaron was at the meeting with Paul Ray and stood up and said, I have not seen anything. She lives a ways away. She then proceeded to explain to a 30-year veteran of the planning department how he was wrong in his interpretation of the genesis and evolution of this petition. She never talked to any of us directly at that meeting. In your emails, you have been given direct examples of the personal impact to the neighborhood on to the neighbors on Sherman Avenue. Most of them hide in the shadows because they see how the mob has attacked me. That impact includes res residents sneaking out, non-residents sneaking in, suspected drug deals, the mentally ill walking the neighborhood, acting erratically. The walk-up homeless seeking refuge, the middle of the night, bizarre behavior. This is not a hospice. These people are dangerous. You are ruining my neighborhood, and I plead with you, do not let them do this. Hi, my name is Dane Johansson. Um, I live on Yale Avenue. And come here um, begrudgingly. Um, to speak about compassion. Um, Utah has a drug problem and a, and a mental health problem, not a homelessness problem or a housing affordability problem. People on the streets, almost without exception, are there due to substance abuse or mental health issues. This is to emphasize the need for compassion, not to allot blame. Compassion in the case of someone with a substance abuse problem or mental health issue comes in the form of compulsory intervention. That type of intervention cannot be provided in a voluntary facility. Decriminalizing drug abuse legislatively or through decreased enforcement as the city, county, and state governments have done will lead to more broken lives and early deaths. It is not effective or compassionate. The in-between is a backdoor method for locating a homeless shelter in the Sugar House, Harvard, Yale neighborhoods, something that was overwhelmingly rejected by the public less than two years ago. It is a backdoor method because it is largely using public and pseudo-public funds and financing and, becomes a and because it comes with a clever cover story that is above reproach, that the shelter is for those battling terminal illnesses. In fact, as admitted regularly in public forums and on grant applications by the in-between, substantially all of its residents do not have terminal illnesses and admissions are made without advanced certification of any sort of medical condition. I started my comments by discussing compassion for people with addiction problems. I speak now about compassion for residents of neighborhoods in which homeless shelters would be located. Simply put, locating facilities housing a large number of persons with substance abuse problems, criminal and sex offense 
records is an infringement on the right to enjoyment of the property of surrounding property owners. When the city, county, and state governments sanction this type of facility, this constitutes a taking under the U.S. Constitution, the deprivation of a property right. I warn the council Time. of the claims that sanctioning the location of these sorts of facilities can have legally and politically, although it may seem politically positive to seem conspicuously compassionate by disregarding the safety of neighbors and downplaying or underreporting crime, the silent majority will protect themselves politically. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Johansson. Bernie Hart, followed by Valerie Fritz. Thank you. Uh, it seems like we've been here before. Uh, I think at the start of the shelters and all the stuff with the Pioneer Park Coalition, the Downtown Alliance and their uh, efforts to relocate the homeless, uh, the Simpson Street, the same type of discussions were taking place. And uh, they're going to take a place again in the future when the shelters come into place. As you all know, I work very uh, extensively with the homeless. I know the community very well. We interact with them on a number of different levels. And uh, in support of the homeless themselves, I wish I had a few people here to speak for me, that many of the programs that are being, uh, facilities that are being used are not meeting the needs of the non-addicts in the homeless community. I just had a conversation with a young man today that has health problems and he can't sleep at night because the shelters are, there's too many addicts and too many, too much activity associated with addiction going on with the shelters at night. I would urge you, urge you, almost beg you, in the name of the non-addicted homeless individuals out there in the shelters and in the different, even the in-between, addicts need drugs. Addicts need money to, for drugs. They don't care where they get the money from. They get it from other homeless individuals and other patients and other street, and they buy the drugs wherever they are, and the drugs are made available. I would ask you to take a pause and take a deep breath before you approve or disapprove any action connected with this facility until you can have a more intense conversation on drugs and mental health. Because the shelters that are going to come online are going to fail just the way they failed in the past unless you find a way to deal with addiction. And there is no way because I've asked the, the administration, I've asked the, the people that run the shelters or are going to run the shelters for what they're going to do and how they're going to handle this situation, and Time. nobody has an answer that satisfies the needs Time. of those non-addicted homeless individuals. Thank you. Hi, I'm Valerie Fritz. I am a staff member at the In Between and have been since about two months after it opened. After I had retired and got bored and was asked to help out, and I said, okay, I think I can do this. I've had family members who've been hospice patients. I can't imagine dying alone on the streets. And I also spent 38 years in the drug and alcohol field running residential treatment programs in residential neighborhoods. And a part of what you're considering is the impact of neighborhoods when you make zoning changes. And I think we do need the zoning changes. The residential programs that we ran for men, for youth, and for mothers with children fit into the neighborhoods, although occasionally there was an initial uproar, just like we have here with the in-between moving in a residential center. We did not have crime, although they were addicted. They were supervised, as are the clients at the in-between. The in-between clients are there for medical reasons. They don't just run the streets, and many are dying. And I would like you to think about that as you consider changes that we do need to make. And uh, with the in-between definitely wants to be a good community neighbor and certainly to work on any of the issues. We do hold AA and NA meetings. We take clients to Project Reality when they're opiate addicts. And we work to link them into treatment as they leave us if they're respite clients who are in recovery from illness or injuries. 
So I hope that helps a little bit because we do recognize the issues of addiction and mental health and we work with Valley Behavioral Health and we also connect clients there as a resource. Thank you. Deb Sussman followed by David Sonnerich. Hello, my name is Deb Sussman, and I don't live in Salt Lake City. I live out in Sandy. I've been a nurse for 30 years in emergency rooms dealing with an awful lot of homeless, mental illness, and addiction. Most of the people in Sandy have support. Homeless people don't have support, and I really don't think that it's fair or right or moral to treat them and put them somewhere else and segregate them. They have the same needs and wants and desires and to leave them out on the street with no place to go when they're in that situation doesn't speak very highly of us as um, human beings and compassionate and I think that, um, that we really do need to work on it. Um, I've been there several times. I've been to several events, fundraisers, and those people are always appreciative, always respectful, and the community as a whole really does come out and support them, and I think that that's a, that's a really good thing, so I would really like you to consider it. Um, there's a lot of residential places that work just fine, and. I don't know the statistics about the crime in that area. I know every time I go there, I feel safe. I don't see drug, I don't see people walking around acting suspicious or behavior like I do um, down in the Rio Grande area. So um, it's all a learning experience for all of us, but I think that we really do need to treat them as human beings in the correct manner. Thank you. Hello, I'm David Sonnenreich. I'm a board member with the In-Between. I've been living on the East Bench since about 69. Um, I view the In-Between as an enhancement to my neighborhood. And I say that, uh, first let me say, I think it is a medical respite facility, a term that now the Utah legislature in the last session has used twice in bills that were passed, and it would be consistent with that law to change the terminology here. Um, to conflate this and somehow with the facilities for homeless people at uh, Rio Grande, uh, I should mention also I'm the chair of the Social Action Committee of the Jewish Congregation, Kola Me. And um, I've been and worked all those facilities. There's no comparison. This is a medical facility for people who are sick and dying. It is a safe facility. I feel safe there. I'm grateful as a volunteer that I can go to a safe place in my own neighborhood. I'm no longer that young and be able to do volunteer work in that safe environment that I, my wife can go there at night, I'm not worried about her going to help and volunteer. I view volunteerism as a core value in Utah. It's one of the things we're best known for. It brings our communities together despite our religious differences, our political differences, and the ability to do volunteer work in my own neighborhood on a cause that's deeply important, which is helping people who are sick and dying, that to me is an enhancement to my community. It, it makes it a better place for me to live. Thank you. William Grua, followed by George Chapman. Hi, my name is William Grua. I'm a longtime resident of Salt Lake City, resident of Council District 4, a retired business executive, and I currently serve as a member of the board of the In-Between. I've been with the In-Between for uh, two, three, four years. Very, very proud of the In-Between. Believe that the In-Between uh, is provides an enormous service in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'd like to speak today to a couple of points. One, obviously I support the change in the uh, medical respite facility definitions and the other specific points made uh, in the in-between statements and by other members uh, will make in writing. But I'd also like to make a personal statement that uh, in my time at the in-between, uh, as I have worked with the executive and professional and administrative staffs of the in-between, uh, I am very, very proud of their 
uh, obviously their dedication and their hard work, but also the integrity and the sensitivity they've got about dealing with whatever problems or issues that they've had to deal with. Uh, they make me proud as a member resident of Salt Lake City, and I wanted to give this chance to come out and say that. Thank you. Okay, this is rushed beyond belief. You're not supposed to be putting something like this into effect without really seriously considering it, and you've only been considering it for a month. The neighborhood deserves more. You should wait until the shelters open, the new shelters open, and see the effect on them. And we, th there's no map right now for institutional zones. This affects institutional zones. So you're actually putting, thinking about implementing an ordinance without knowing what properties are affected. So neighbors don't know. They could find out next year they're right next to an institutional zone that could be turned into a homeless shelter. That's wrong. So I urge you not to go forward and rush through this. Wait for a map. Wait till the shelter is open. Um, we also have spent years trying to reduce the sex offender uh, concentration near families. And all of a sudden we have five registered sex offenders in one single family home neighborhood. That's concerning to neighbors. You shouldn't be dismissing that. That's a real serious concern for neighbors and families. Um, we don't have a lack of pub we have a lack of public engagement. We have no conditional use standards. But the most important issue is the in between, which functions as and provides a very important service, is functioning as a winter overflow shelter. It wasn't meant to, and it's saving lives, but it's functioning as a winter overflow shelter, and that's wrong. It's in the middle of a single family home neighborhood. It should be near stores, it should be near services, it should be near transit. It shouldn't be treating the patients as prisoners. They deserve better. The neighborhood deserves better, and the in-between residents deserve better too. Please don't rush this through. It deserves more uh, overview and public engagement. We want respect for the residents of the in-between. We also want respect for the neighborhood. It deserves to be Time. thoroughly thought out. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Mr. Chapman. Corey Holdaway, followed by Makita Hart. Thank you, members of the council. Um, first of all, I'd like to first thank you for the service that you provide the city. Um, it's an important service, uh, being the voice of the people and listening to the people and recognizing sometimes that voice is hard to, um, to square um, with everyone. Um, my mother often said, uh, you can't keep all, or you, you can only keep uh, some of the people happy some of the time, but you can't keep all the people happy all the time. And uh, I, I find this kind of one of those issues. Um, this, this is a, uh, a challenging issue. I became acquainted with the in-between two years ago and um, when they were on Goshen Street. And when I became acquainted with them, I thought, uh, if there is nothing else that government provides, it is something like this in terms of service to, um, to those that are unable to provide service for the, or provide for themselves um, in the wake of serious illness or, or death. Um, I can't imagine having a loved one die in a uh, in a way that uh, is laying down in the middle of the street somewhere. The in-between is an opportunity for us as a society to provide support to those that, that don't have that, that don't have that luxury. Salt Lake City has long been known for uh, the compassion that you've shown in, uh, in many different areas. And I hope in this case that, uh, that you continue to show that compassion, to show the, uh, the other areas of the state the importance of, of leadership um, with regard to a, an at-risk group. And uh, I just say, again, thank you for your service.
Hi, I'm Marita Hart. No, oh, it looked like a K. Come on. It sure it wasn't. No, oh, Andrew, is this a K? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you got me all shook up and I forgot what I wanted to say. Um, I'm just here to support the in between because um, we work with uh, 45 to 50 homeless people five days a week. And um, well, I've already talked to them about the fact that there's some of those individuals that are going to have to come to the in-between. And like others have said, I don't want to see them on the street. And that is a very safe place for them to go. So it's, I feel it's very vital to have the in-between. And uh, I appreciate what, you've, what you're doing. Thank you. All right, here we go. This is another one. Sigi Petzold, followed by Dorothy P. Owen. Hi, I'm Siggy. Um, I'm here in support of the in-between. So when we hear the word homeless, a lot, of people have a, a lot of people have preconceived notions and beliefs immediately to addiction, danger, and I believe that every, almost every person in this room is guilty of passing one of those people on the street and not giving them the time of day to look at them. I'm guilty of myself. And I come to you as myself as a homeless resident of the rescue mission. So from a side that hasn't been spoken for yet, I've been in the shelters, I've lived there, and the in-between is anything but a homeless shelter. A homeless shelter means you can just walk in when you have nowhere to go. High, drunk, whatever. And the in-between is not about that. These people don't just walk in off the street. These are people with legitimate medical needs. I got a job there and they were giving me a second chance to get my life turned around. And on my third day of employment, we had a resident pass away, something that I wasn't expecting to see so soon. Before my third week, we had a second resident pass away. These are human beings that are dying, that are sick, that are in medical need. Living in the homeless shelter, I've seen many people go to the hospital and get treatment and then immediately get turned away for lack of insurance. A lot of hospitals will say, homeless, okay, here you go, have a nice night. And they have medical needs that would kill them on the street. This place provides a safe place for these guys to turn to when they have nowhere else to go with these severe medical needs and they're shown love and care and compassion. And it is, the most, like, it is the quietest, safest place that I've ever been to. I feel safe there and I feel fulfilled when I walk out those doors every day. I interact with the people that are there. And they're humans just like you and me. They want love and compassion just like you and me. They're no different. Just because of their position and situation in life doesn't make us any better or them any less. So I'm just up here to stand up here and say that I'm supporting the in-between fully. Thank you. So my name is Dorothy Owen, and I wasn't going to speak, but I thought it was probably important to have someone that was not from the neighborhood, but had been involved with the in-between at the Goshen site. So I had volunteered at the Goshen site and worked with them. And at that time I was aware of, I had worked in the homeless programs for about 10 years before volunteering with them. So I knew what a homeless shelter looked like. I'd worked in one and I knew what uh, the in-between did. Um, and they're certainly very different. But I think at the time I read the articles from the neighbors and their concerns, I first thought, you know, why do we have this terrible problem? This isn't the, the organization I know. And it was concerning because I really believe that it's important to allow the neighborhood to express their feelings and have answers to that. Um, but what I've determined in my own mind is that this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to face our fears, both by, um, as elected officials, as as neighbors, and not to think, you know, how does it affect my neighborhood and that, but what's the basic issue? And the issue is people are sick and dying and we need to take, be good human beings and address that issue. And sometimes you're gonna get criticized for doing the right thing. Um, and what I would just like to ask the neighbors to do is take a breath, step back. Being from the west side, we often feel beat up we often feel like the east side doesn't pay attention to us. We're trying to listen to you also, and we all need to recognize that there are opportunities that are difficult that we want to take advantage of. Thank you.
Thank you, Dorothy. Deborah Thorpe, followed by Charlotte Fife Jefferson. Hello, I'm uh, Deborah Thorpe. I am a nurse practitioner and the founder of the In Between, which actually uh, was born out of an effort uh, some 10 years ago. And it took us that long to organize the, uh, the necessary support to lead to our uh, opening the facility on Goshen Street and now succeeding beyond my wildest imagination uh, on 13th South. I, I want to emphasize the difference between the, the in-between and a homeless shelter. A homeless shelter is a very brief respite off the street for overnight. We provide uh, these people we, with a home. They are no longer homeless. This is their home to stay until they die, or for the short term for those who need the medical respite who are seriously ill, many of whom are cancer patients undergoing uh, very difficult cancer treatments, and some eventually become hospice candidates. We established the in-between in order to provide a broader uh, opportunity for meeting the needs of the seriously ill uh, persons in this city so that they do not have to die on the street. We have had even successes where because we provide the necessary basic needs of shelter, food, uh, we become surrogate family members, uh, we, they live under a very structured environment. Uh, and many of, many of them have actually become healed. We have one graduate of our program who was an addict, who was very ill, came to us uh, with the expectation Time. that he might not live two Time. weeks, uh, who is now a, uh, because he healed, was able to go on to become a productive member of society and now has a full-time job and lives in uh, Arizona. So the difference is quite substantial. Thank you, Ms. Thorpe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlotte Fife Jefferson, and I live two blocks away from where the in-between was originally in Poplar Grove. Um, as neighbors, we were concerned, you know, about what was when the in-between was first coming in. But once I got to know um, what the what the organization did, and I volunteered there, um, and I became a part of the Neighborhood Advisory Council, um, I could see that it wasn't a homeless shelter. It wasn't like, like the road home. It wasn't, uh, that, that fear was not a reality. So um, living on the west side, I've seen, a, well, we've all seen an increase in homelessness in our city. But we see it a lot along the Jordan River Parkway Trail, along in our parks, um, right by our house on the west side. And, you know, there is, there is a temptation to not want to see that. You know, we don't, maybe if they would go away, then we wouldn't have to think about them. But it's a reality that there are sick and dying people on the streets um, I volunteered for the point in time homeless count this year and saw many of them and spoke to them. We, we interviewed them. And I just think, is it better for our society to have them living on the streets? Is it safer or, or in a facility like the in-between where they're more um, taken care of and monitored? You know, I, I think so. So I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Virginia Lopez followed by Blair Hodges and Tom Huckin is across the hall and just he wanted enough time to get over here. So come on down, Tom.
Hi, I'll try to stand tall. Uh, my name is Virginia Lopez, and uh, many of you have volunteered for me at the Wigan Center. I've, I've worked at, at uh, Catholic Community Services, um, both in the kitchen and I ran the Wigan Center for several years. I've been working with the homeless for more than 40 years. I continue to work for drug and alcohol treatment. I continue to work for the homeless to try and get them into housing. I'm so excited about the new housing that, that has come forth as of yesterday for, for the homeless, the apartments that are going to come open here soon. Right now, I, I work one-on-one -on -one with clients uh, doing counseling. I have had clients die in my hands. Um, I've seen people with bre breast cancer. When I call the ambulance, the ambulance is they fell, their bre the breast fell off. So I know the need. And I, I think uh, institutions like the in-between are important, but not in the neighborhood. And I don't live two blocks away, okay? I don't live, you know, four blocks away. I'm not on the board, and I'm not a volunteer over there because I do it at my work, okay? But the one thing I know is I live houses away from that in-between. I've had my garbage cans thrown. I've come around the corner, and most, most of the clients, and, and I love doing what I do, okay? Clients come around, the, I come around the corner, and clients are like, Gina, Gina, can you get me housing? You know, and I'm glad to help them, but not this close to my house. And that's not, I, I mean, I have people coming up on my doorstep that, that know me and, and know that I am working for them, okay? But this does not belong in a small neighborhood. My neighbor's house, they walked in the house, they took the canes, they, my neighbors are hard of hearing, and we live in a real close neighborhood. And they leave the door open so I can come and check them because they're elderly. But they walked in, took the, his cane and his walker. The other neighbors, we've had every, I can tell you stories, but I am against changing the ordinance to let them grow bigger, and um, I just don't think it should be in my neighborhood. Thank you, Tina. In our neighborhood. Tom, I hope you're making your way over. You're after Blair Hodges. My name is Blair Hodges. My daughter attends kindergarten near the in-between. First, I want to thank everybody on the council for listening to the citizens here uh, in the community. I also want to thank everybody in this room, whether I agree with them or not, for spending their evening tonight on, on something that they're passionate about. Um, I've studied this issue carefully, and I've studied the work of the in-between. I'm not affiliated with them. I don't personally know anybody who works with them. My daughter attends school near the facility. Safety is a concern for every citizen here. Nobody in this room would tell you that they don't care about safety. Because my daughter attends school near this area, we've, it's something that I've thought about. And we've actually had frequent discussions about homeless people that we see around the city. We teach my daughter a simple song. The song goes, because I have been given much, I too must give. We teach my daughter how to be safe. We know my daughter can be at risk sometimes. She can be at risk in our home. She can be at risk in the homes of our friends. She can be at risk regardless of whether her school is near a facility like this. I have fear. But I beat my fear through action. I confront my fear by volunteering. And I commit to volunteer with the in-between to do away with my fear. I don't want to fear in between. The real scandal is that we're only talking about one facility in a neighborhood instead of facilities in every neighborhood where people that don't have a place to go to die can go to die. I encourage the council to adopt the measures that best serves the most vulnerable population of our city. The values of our city can be seen in the ways that we treat the most vulnerable people among us. Please support the in-between. I favor the measure that changes the terminology to medical respite facility, which is language that the state has recently adopted. I believe this is a wise choice, and I believe that I can overcome my fear by engaging directly. And I invite people that have fears in the neighborhood to join me at the in-between and face to face, learn that we don't have to be afraid. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Huckin, followed by Nathaniel Player. Good 
Good evening. Uh, my perspective on this issue is informed by two facts. Uh, number one, uh, my wife and I have owned property on that street only two doors away from the in-between for nine years. We have a son, a daughter-in-law, and a 10-year-old granddaughter living there. They all feel perfectly safe, including the 10-year-old granddaughter who walks past the in-between from home from school every day. She feels perfectly safe. The, the three of them have been so uh, inspired and confident by the, 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 the quietness of the in-between that they've even put up a yard sign on, a, on their property supporting the in-between. Uh, my wife and I have uh, we don't. We own that property. We've been deeply involved with the development of that property for nine years, so we've witnessed um, the transformation of the that property where the in-between is from the Hillside Rehab Center. We've noticed a very, very big difference between the kind of traffic and busyness and so on that was going on with the with Hillside versus the the, the serenity, virtual serenity of the in-between. Uh, it's a remarkable transformation. We were so inspired, my wife and I, by what we were witnessing that we volunteered to work there. So for the past five weeks, we have been working there as volunteers, uh, vacuuming floors, wiping windows, doing whatever menial tasks need to be done. So we have been inside that facility, interacting with people there. It is not a homeless shelter. It is a refuge for people who are dying or who are struggling with a life-threatening disease. Uh, so I urge you to be compassionate about um, this situation, Time. to not listen to the fear mongers who are testifying in the other direction. And I do think that a reclassification, as far as you all are concerned about the legislative issues, a reclassification to the what, what the state has authorized as a category. Time. I think it's called the medical respite facility. I think that's the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm down to my last two cards. Uh, if anyone would like to speak that hasn't had the opportunity, please raise your hand and we'll bring you a card. But Nathaniel Player followed by Ken Kohler. Good evening, members of the council. Thank you for letting everybody speak. Thank you for hearing me. My name is Nathaniel Player. I live two blocks away from the in-between. Um, I bike past the facility regularly. Um, I feel very safe by the in-between. I feel like it's a good addition to the neighborhood. It's very different than when Hillside was there. I do agree that it's calmer. It feels good. Uh, I'm part of a group called Yes in My Backyard. We say yes in my backyard. We support the in-between. And it's a group of people who just live in the neighborhood who were saddened by the report coming out in the Tribune and by the conversation and the tone of the conversation. These are people who believe in the work of the in-between. We are grateful for what they do and we want to help it. Um, I'll speak from my own values. I believe that every human being has worth. People who are unhoused are still people. And my community should be a community that is kind, caring, and supportive. That's why I'm here. That's why the uh, Yes in My Backyard group exists. Uh, we believe that quality medical care should be available to everybody. And we believe that it's a tragedy that, and a societal failure that people should die on the street. I think that lessens all of us. Um, we know, studies show, that people who are unhoused are unhoused because of a lack of affordable housing, because of unemployment, poverty, low wages, domestic violence, and mental illness. Most people who are unhoused do have unmet medical needs. And people who are unhoused are more susceptible to diseases, have greater dis difficulty accessing quality medical care, and are harder to treat. Uh, we also know that 121 people died on the street last year. So I support the change in the zoning law. And I want you to know that I support the in-between, and there are other people who also support the in-between. We are proud of the work. We're glad to have them in our community. And I thank you for your leadership on this issue. Ken Kohler, and Ken is the last comment that I've got this evening. Hi, we 
thank you for this opportunity first. My wife and I are neighbors of the in between. We've lived in the area for the general area for just about all of our married life. We just celebrated our 47th anniversary. Uh, my wife has lived in across from what used to be, or what, what is now the in between and used to be the uh, a number of different rest homes and nursing homes. Believe me, it, we had uh, ambulances and fire trucks going there two or three times, uh, oh, more than that, it was at least three times a, a week and many times in the middle of the night. I, I think I've seen one ambulance go over there since the in-between opened up. My, like I said, my wife has lived there for uh, six decades. And uh, the traffic, as I think Reverend uh, Tom Goldsmith said, his was, was twice, three times as bad as it is now. And you, you couldn't, with, with cars parked up and, down, up and down the side of the street on, on 13th South. And there's also uh, an issue with, uh, with the homeless. The veterans make make up a, a, a disproportionate amount of the population of the homeless. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I'm also a veteran for peace. And many of these men have been injured uh, psychologically and emotionally, even more than psycho psychologically, and of course physically. They need a place and deserve a place time to to die and i would beg you people to please take all this into consideration when you when you make your decisions thank you thank you all right catherine i want to say it's toronto pretty good right toronto? that's what like toronto canada okay well Kind of looks like an eye to me. I don't want to have to take a picture and send it, but you know. I didn't understand the timing, so I didn't know. Anyway, I'm not going to use my card because I don't have it. Did I write a card? I wrote. You it. did. You wrote on it. We can keep it if you would like. But if you want to say something, please do. Well. Yeah, you can read your card. <laughs> don't start the time. And then I'm going to try one more. Lorelai Dolph is next. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to read from the card or this. They're both pretty illegible. But anyway, my name is Catherine. Um, I'm a volunteer at The In-Between. I clean toilets. I wash windows. I vacuum. I lift heavy boxes. I organize food. I organize supplies and clothing and whatever else they ask me to do. I oftentimes sit at the front desk and see who comes and goes. Um, it's just not a free-for-all there like maybe has been expressed tonight. I'm concerned about some phraseology that's been used tonight. And one is the term they. I don't know what they means. They come in and they do this to my neighbors. They do this, you know, who are they? And the other term is, um, let's see, the other term I've been a little bit concerned about is, um, well, I'll come back to that because I can't quite remember, but I've heard terminology that, that isn't quite correct. Oh yeah, giving numbers. This is how many are on hospice. This is how many are not. You know what? It's an ever ebb and flow experience there. But I want to tell you a little bit about my family experience. I have a father and a brother. My brother was a veteran. My father um, went to George Washington, um, was an attorney, worked for senators and congressmen before coming back to Salt Lake to establish a path uh, practice and uh, serve in politics and on in any council and um, any kind of community service he could give. Um, his last appointed office was um, Attorney General. He ran for governor on the Democratic ticket as a Latter-day Saint man and that didn't go down very well here in Salt Lake. Um, Dad became quite ill in his life. And during a perfect storm that hit him like a tsunami from two or three different forces, my dad lost everything. But he paid all of his bills. He paid all of his attorney fees from a terrible embezzlement uh, case that went down. 
and he ended Time. up losing everything. Oh, my father ended up indigent and homeless. I want you to know he would have been the perfect resident at the in-between. He would have had friends there because the men were and are and the women respectable. That is the reason I'm there. It has my heart and my soul. So let's not use the word they as though it's everybody. The in-between serves one time. at a time. My dad was on hospice and he would have been admitted there. That is where he belonged after I took care of him for many years in my home. Thank you, thank so you Ms. Durano. So this story is not as simple as just the facts lay it out to be. And we'll thank use you. your comments on the back of the card if you'll bring it back to me. We'll make sure that those are posted to the... Thank you. Lorelai Dolph, followed by Mohammed Mian. This will be quick. I marked the wrong box. So if you could just um, read my, my comment. Okay. We'll I, add to so it. I, if that's... I, won't, I won't go verbal on this and, and save some time, but thanks. Thank you. We've got that there. We've got one more. Mark DeSaint Albine, followed by Jason Seaton. Good evening, members of the Salt Lake Council. Thank you for your listening ears. Um, I serve, um, my day job is at the U of U College of Social Work. I specialize in medical social work with an emphasis in hospice and working with the dying. I've been there 25 years. The um, involvement I've had with the in-between has been as first a volunteer and then as a member of the board for two years. It's been my opportunity to see the workings of the in-between from the inside under the administration, the volunteers, the employees. I have been very impressed at the regard that the members of the staff and the volunteers have, not just for the residents, but for the neighborhood. Um, there are individuals we recognize in the neighborhood that have, that have concerns. I have seen the members of the in-between reach out to the neighborhood, myself being one of them, supported by the in-between to see if these concerns can be resolved. Our hope is that we can become an integrated part of the neighborhood in a way that supports the compassionate care that is provided there as well as the concerns that can be addressed to the neighbors which we've tried to address. My hope and my belief is that these concerns can be resolved even in the present neighborhood. I support the, the change to a medical respite facility and I think that that supports the mission of those receiving care there. Um, and I thank you for listening to our views. Thank you, sir. Jason Seaton is the final comment card that I've got this evening. You know, I, I came down here tonight um, just for fun. I had no idea what was on the agenda. <laughs> Um, so, when I came in the room, I realized, wow, somebody's upset. Because this is exactly what happened in Poplar Grove in our community council meeting when the in-between moved into the neighborhood. A lot of people showed up. No one was ever around. Vigilance was so low until something like this happened. Um, but what turned out was, over the course of a few months, uh, people who were had their backyards right up to the facility, came back to the community council one or two at a time when someone from the in-between showed up and said, it's actually been really good. They've been really good neighbors. And they, and they really had been um, up until they moved out. And uh, I understand your fear. I was afraid as well. I mean, we already have enough problems. You think, you think this is tough. We've got the most kids in our neighborhood. 
right? We have tons. I have four elementary schools within the walking distance of my house, and we have more sex offenders, more halfway hot houses, we have more homeless in our vicinity than anywhere else in the city. So those of you who are really afraid of this situation need to consider that you're getting off light. <laughs> so so as, as there is further redistribution of folks who have issues, medical, mental, uh, addiction, all of those, all of those will be redistributed in this city. We can't handle the load, <clears throat> excuse me, we can't handle the load in just a couple of neighborhoods, Glendale, Papa Grove, and Fair Park. So I just, want, I just want everyone to realize that this is the easiest part. This is a very controlled situation, and it's a very clean situation. Thank you for your time. OK. Anyone else want to speak? Mr. Chair? Yes. I want to move that the council continue this public hearing to a future council meeting. And I want to request that the administration conduct some additional research based on the open house that was held last week, the work that's been happening with the council, and what we've heard from the public hearing tonight. And then come back to the council with suggestions potentially pertaining to uh, the proposed congregate care elmosinary definitions and review whether establishing qualifying provisions would be appropriate for this proposed use. And that, at that time, we'll hold another public hearing. Second. I was just going to ask if that included the uh, new state wording as well. That's part of the feedback we've been receiving, so I know that the planning department's listening to that. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Mendenhall and a second by Council Member Luke. Any other further discussion? Please. I want to echo what a lot of people have said and thank you all for coming out here tonight. Thank you if you came to the open house the planning commission held last week and thank you to the dozens, probably hundreds of people that we've heard from through email and phone calls and I want to thank my peers for listening. A lot of conversations coming in at us and mostly to the community for having a voice. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that motion continues. We are on to item B8. We can wait while the, uh, those who were here for B7 exit. How was it that far off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you were good. Yeah. Yes. Oh, they did. And I'm going to tell them. <laughs> Oh! I got some water. No, no. I don't Okay, but we still have a meeting, so if you could quickly exit. If you're leaving, please quickly exit so we can get back to CDBG. What do you love? Jason. Yep. Okay, we're going to jump back into item B8, the one-year action plan for community development block grant and other federal grants for fiscal year 2019-2020. So I'm going to read, this is interesting, I'm going to read your name, but then council members, I'm also going to read the page and the number. Mr. Vice Chair, I have a, a disclosure to make before we continue. Um, I would like to disclose that I've been employed by NeighborWorks in the past um, and occasionally do contract work for NeighborWorks Salt Lake, which is one of the organizations that is requesting funds. And I will recuse myself at the time of discussion and vote. Okay, perfect. Mr. Chair, can I take a turn too? Maybe, yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I also will recuse myself from the uh, ECESG vote, excuse me. I work for Volunteers of America Utah. Um, who has applied for funding, so I won't be here for the discussion. 
um, or the actual vote, but I'll be sitting through the uh, open uh, public hearing tonight. Okay, great. Uh, same rules apply. We're going to start with uh, Mr. David Woodman. His is CDBG, page two, number one, followed by Mike Ackerlow. Welcome by, back, Mr. Ackerlow. Good evening. Uh, I'm Dave Woodman. I'm the, the housing director at ASSIST. This year we celebrate 50 years of helping some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Over those years, our most stalwart partner has been Salt Lake City. ASSIST has three primary programs. Number one, the emergency home repair program. These are critical repairs to enable a family to continue to live in their home. Nothing cosmetic, no remodeling. Number two, accessibility design. Assessment and design options for practical accessibility modifications. Modifications are built for low-income families. Number three, aging in place. Preventative safety improvements which allow a family to remain in their home as they grow older. Just last week, we braided our efforts with the HAND program to help a family with a difficult roofing problem. This repair would have been impossible without a collaborative approach. My thanks to Jennifer, Marion, and Pablo. In the past two years, because of the incredibly high demand, ASSIST has expended the entire budget before the end of the fiscal year. Any increase in our funding would be used to help additional families. Thank you for the Mayor's recommendation to the Council, to the staff, and the CDAC volunteers for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Woodman. Mike Akalo, he is CDBG, page two, item number two, followed by Russell Goodman. Good evening, council members. My name is Mike Ackerlow. I'm the CEO of the Community Development Corporation of Utah. We all know that when individuals and family have access to stable, quality, affordable housing, they can become part of a diverse community, find and keep jobs, lead healthier lives, and take better care of their families. CDCU is the only organization in our city that provides down payment assistance. <clears throat> we can provide this assistance to income-restricted families and individuals who are purchasing a home. Finding an affordable home in Salt Lake City is already difficult enough in Salt Lake City, but once it is found, many f need a little help in financing it. The assistance from CDCU provides that help and gets people into a safe and healthy place to live and hopefully allows them to save a little each month. Each client who uses the down payment assistance funds also goes through a required counseling uh, program to help them become and remain financially secure. This, in addition to living in an affordable home, enables economic mobility and better lives for our residents and strengthens our communities. We appreciate your consideration in funding our requests as recommended by the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackerlow. Russell Goodman, he is, will be speaking on CDBG page number two, uh, item number three and four, ESG page 11, number two and three, home page 13, number five. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Russell Goodman, and I'm here representing the Housing Authority of Salt Lake City. Uh, the Housing Authority's mission is to provide affordable housing in our community. Uh, we do this by building housing, by administering housing vouchers, and by writing grants. Uh, we submitted multiple applications for funding from the city this year for a variety of homeless programs, rehab projects, and apartment complex acquisition. Uh, our grant writers were very excited to hear that we were recommended for one of those um, for the Home funds, $87,301 to provide at least 48 households with deposit assistance. And this is an exciting program that allows us to hopefully incentivize landlords to rent with us um, by offering up to double deposits and giving people an opportunity to move into housing that otherwise don't qualify for programs. Um, we administer two similar grants, uh, come to us from the state, and we're excited to have this to fill the gaps that those have, especially for individuals who don't typically get a lot of funding like families or seniors do. Um, very grateful for this opportunity to administer these funds. Uh, if you see fit to fund any of the other ones that weren't recommended, we'll definitely welcome that. Um, but we're very grateful for these funds and excited to use them. Thank you. Thank you. Billy Palmer, he will be speaking on page two, number five is CDBG, followed by, by Sophia Keller Columbus. Uh, Sophia Keller from Columbus Community Center. Thank you for your time. I'm Billy Palmer. I'm the ex officio of NeighborWorks as their former board president. And I came down as a switch hitter because our president had to leave. And so this is the only time that I will ever be in front of you with a hoodie on, I promise. 
the current um, recommendation for CDBG funds for NeighborWorks is zero. And I wanted to talk to you about that because it's uh, cited because we did not s draw down all of our funds or spend our money. Um, what it's overlooking is that uh, it goes into a rotating fund and we have currently $800,000 uh, being cycled through in that fund. And in that fund, uh, we help folks uh, stay out of uh, private mortgage insurance so they can af better afford their homes, home improvements, uh, all sorts of things that for the most vulnerable people that live in our neighborhoods that we serve. So there is $273 still in that fund and uh, we have some projects uh, that did not time out quite this year. But uh, we have a home in Poplar Grove that will spend $250,000, home improvement of $45,000, and six affordable units, uh, each under 200, oh, somewhere around $250,000. Uh, we've had a relationship with the city and have uh, drawn CDBG funds. In fact, we were born uh, of, uh, with the city in mind being able to spend its CDBG dollars um, and now you have neighbor works. Um, this is a twofold conversation though. Uh, the reason that we um, ha have not been able to rotate our funds is now we have more competition. Uh, we've done such a good job, it's been duplicated even by folks like yourselves. Here in the city, we have the same services. And our biggest competition is the same people that are saying that we should uh, receive zero dollars. So. While you are our biggest competition, the city, um, we feel that it's probably best um, since there was so much um, need for homeless, uh, for, excuse me, for affordable housing, there's so many ways to spend it that uh, it seems unfair that we are in competition and then we are being denied money uh, by the people that make this decision. You, our biggest comp computer, comp competitors, thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry, it must be Safia Keller, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. You got one. I did. <laughs> Good evening, uh, CDBG, council members, and on, thank uh, you. CDBG, page four, item number four. Okay. Thank you. I am Safia Keller, and I'm the Chief Employment Development Officer at Columbus Community Center, and I'm here to talk about uh, our community employment program. Individuals with disabilities face an unemployment rate of 65%. Individuals with autism face an unemployment rate of 80 to 90%. And individuals with college degrees with autism face an unemployment rate of 85%. This is all in light of Utah's unemployment rate being around 3%. If uh, awarded the funds, we will use these funds to pay uh, portions of salaries for our job developer and our job coach. Um, and we will serve approximately 165 total individuals, 50 of whom will live within the uh, block grant boundary area. We focus on the employer's needs and our job seeker skills rather than just training them and then hoping that we can get them a job in the community and we have been very, very successful doing that. With our community partners and our employers and Salt Lake City who has been a wonderful partner of ours um, and Division of uh, Vocational Rehabilitation, our work is made possible and we are successful. Since July 1st, so eight months, we have placed 40 individuals in jobs and we anticipate uh, placing another 20 to 25 at the end of June. So thank you very much for your consideration. And getting these individuals jobs is more than just um, them earning a paycheck. It is about dignity and having a sense of purpose in life and uh, feeling that they are contributing in their community. So thank you. Thank you. Austin Davis, and he will be speaking to CDBG, page five, number six and seven as well as ESG page nine, number two. Hello, um, I'm Austin Davis, the Associate Director at First Step House. Uh, just on, on behalf of First Step House, uh, our staff and our patients just want to thank really the council, 
uh, the mayor and, and the staff and the other departments here at Salt Lake City for all your continued support of, of what, we, what, we, what we do at First Step House. Uh, you've allowed us to expand treatment, expound housing, and, and really improve our services over the years. Uh, I'd like to, to thank you for your consideration of our, of our three uh, requests, uh, the first of which is our peer support program. Um, it's integrated into our residential treatment program. It's, de it's designed and implemented according to evidence-based models and includes the, the delivery of wellness uh, recovery action plans to program pr participants. Um, research indicates that the clients who receive these services have fewer crises, hospitalizations, less al alcohol and drug use, enhanced income, um, housing stability and employment. Um, we track eight outcomes in this program. Um, and we actually exceed or meet all the metrics on all those. Of the people who have completed RAP plans, 92% of them who are homeless or at risk for homeless leave our programs with stable housing. 57% um, increase employment and 84% um, report improvements to health. And, and actually 77% um, of them com complete a community service project within the community. So it's a really cool program. Our other program uh, is our employment preparation and placement program. Uh, we just started this program in November and um, funding from the city will allow us to continue this funding into to the next fiscal year. Um, uh, within, since November, we've been able to implement this program to Fidelity. Uh, we've served over 45 clients, 16 of those who have, um, who have gained employment, and we've actually made contact with over 150 employers within the community to, to coordinate services and employment services with, with uh, employers in the community. Um, Let's see, the 30,000 for that will allow us to continue this program and also leverage additional funding in the community to, to, to continue with this, these services within, within to the few, with, into fiscal year 2020. Um, the last, our last request is for our resource center program. So uh, this, this year uh, we collaborated with the, with the road home, wow to provide behavioral health treatment services uh, at the shelter. Uh, this is a, a needed program, as, as many people have all already spoke about this uh, within the community. A lot of people at the shelter are in need of behavioral health services, and this allows us to provide those services to those people Thank in need. You. Thank you. Elsa Burrell, and she is speaking to CDBG, page five, number eight. Good evening, uh, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Guadalupe um, Center Educational Programs. My name is Elsa Burrell and I'm the Early Learning Center Director at Guadalupe. Uh, we have requested funding for CDBG for public services to support our Early Learning Center, uh, which houses three of the four, uh, five programs offered at Guadalupe. These three programs uh, include in-home visiting, toddler beginnings, and preschool programs. Our Early Learning Center serves children birth through four years of age. Nearly all of the families we serve live below the federal poverty line, and the vast majority of our students are English language learners. Our in-home and toddler beginnings programs provide at-risk babies and toddlers with support to help them reach age-appropriate development milestones before entering preschool. And these funds that we're requesting will be used to help cover the salary partial salary of three toddler beginnings teachers that serve up to 30 children, two-year-old children, and the balance will be used to also help pay a portion of the parent educators to visit homes to serve each 12 children. Uh, we're grateful for the support that we received through CDBG the past few years. It has greatly helped us achieve our mission of transforming lives through education. Of the students entering our kindergarten last year at our charter school, the students who participated in the Early Learning Center were more than twice as likely to enter kindergarten meeting um, readiness expectancies as the peers who did not participate. And our parents are grateful for the program. Um, our more, most recent uh, parent-teacher conferences earlier this month, parents expressed how their children love coming to school and parents believe they were doing a great job to get them ready for the next step in their schooling. So thank you so much again for your past support and for considering our current um, request. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Christy Nielermay from the International Rescue Committee, CDBG, page five, item number nine. Hello, it is an honor to be here tonight in front of you. Thank you, council and mayor and her staff for this recommendation. Um, I represent the International Rescue Committee here in Salt Lake City, and this project is getting up to speed, expanding digital services for refugees and asylees here in Salt Lake. 
Um, if awarded this, I will be overseeing this program and will ensure its success. This is the first year of this. So IRC offers digital programming for refugees to help them participate in the ever-expanding digital world. Digital education is integral to many of our refugees who have limited background with digital tools or have any access to them. So through this project, the IRC will provide tools, instruction for refugees and asylees in three main areas, access to broadband, access to devices, and through education and training. Through this project, we want to provide these tools through um, helping ac refugees and asylum seekers um, communicate um, with communication, with transportation, and community services, focusing on the Salt Lake City's target neighborhoods, and also most at risk uh, populations we serve, which include refugee women. To expand this reach, the IRC also wants to integrate digital education into our livelihood programs. This includes all levels of ESL, early employment, and um, financial education. I want to highlight um, our project's alignment with Mayor Biskupski's public commitment to um, developing a comprehensive digital policy for Salt Lake City. IRC was thrilled to hear that there's going to be higher level policies around digital inclusion, knowing that refugees are one of the most in need groups of this education and this access. So thank you for this opportunity to present this. Um, it is an honor to be here tonight. Um, and I hope that this program will help not only um, get refugees the access they need and the digital tools, um, but also help them pursue their own individual career, financial, and academic goals. Thank you. Elise Kingsley uh, will be speaking to CDBG, page 5, item number 10. This is not at all intimidating. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Elise Kingsley. I'm the development manager at Neighborhood House. We're a nonprofit on the west side of Salt Lake City, and we've been there for 125 years. Mm. We do day services for children and adults and intergenerational programming, but this funding is specifically for our preschool. Um, preschool is uh, offered to um, right now over 100 preschool students. We have over 100 on our waiting list as well. The funding we have right now from the city is just under $34,000 and it covers a portion of the salaries for three of our preschool student or teachers. Um, their salary and benefits and impacts 60 of our students. We're asking for an additional um, fee, so $45,000 this year, which is a little larger. But that would allow us to cover um, a portion of a fourth teacher for benefits and having access to an additional 20 students. Um, so Neighborhood House, I said, is accredited nationally from the National Association for the Education of Young Children. It is only one of 28 of such accreditations in the entire state of Utah. Um, early ed uh, childhood education at Neighborhood House works to ensure that all children are meeting developmental milestones and are kindergarten ready. Our program is, uniquely, is unique in many ways, but it is unique in fact that it responds to working families in ways that other places cannot. One such way is that we are open from 6.30 in the morning until 5.30 in the evening, ensuring that families have the opportunity to seek and maintain employment. Our existence is really to help families climb that economic ladder and get out of poverty while providing access to high quality education for their students. Um, we thank the city for everything that it's done for us and hope that the council will look at what the mayor has um, suggested and will respond to it. Thank you so much. Rebecca Springer, she will be speaking to CDBG page six, item number 11. Uh, good evening, council members. Um, on behalf of Odyssey House of Utah, I would like to thank the members of the Salt Lake City Council for choosing to recommend our vocational training program for funding this year. Um, in response to Operation Rio Grande and the growing number of individuals in our community that need substance abuse treatment, um, Odyssey House has been working to expand its 15 multifaceted programs and uh, facilities. In the last year alone, we've increased the amount of individuals we've served by about 60%. Um, unfortunately, this has taken a toll on our vocational training program. This program offers job training services to every adult client in order to set them up for success post-treatment after discharge. Um, but due to the increase in individuals we serve, it has begun to put a strain on the program itself. Um, vocational training is essential to, um, to individuals in treatment because it provides them with job skills and 
employment readiness and opportunities um, to ease them back into the workforce and later gain higher paying jobs post treatment, allowing them to remain out of poverty and homelessness. Um, by recommending our vocational training program for funding, you're giving us the opportunity to expand this essential program and provide high quality job training to all the adults entering into our residential substance abuse treatment programs at Odyssey House. I thank you for your time and for recommending us. Alexander Harvey will be speaking to CDBG page 6, item number 12. Good evening, council members. My name is Alexandra Harvey. I have been with Salt Lake Donated Dental Services as the board member for the last several years, and it is now my honor to serve as its new executive director. Salt Lake Donated Dental has a long-standing tradition of serving Utah's communities, doing so for nearly 30 years. Our services continuously administer relief to those critically underserved, as well as promote education that will help prevent curable diseases. We are a unique safety net clinic, treating our patients with the same quality of care given in a private dental office. We focus on restorative and preventative care and preserving the oral integrity of our patients. Since 1990, Salt Lake Donated Dental Services has been committed to giving care to the homeless and impoverished in a comprehensive and continuous manner. Since its inception, we have provided more than $22 million in dental services to tens of thousands of individuals suffering from poor oral health. To meet the continuous and growing need for the dental care in this community, Solic Donated Dental has requ respectfully requested the Community Development Block Grant to enable our volunteers and employees to continue providing preventative, restorative, and emergency dental care. Our donated program provides all services at no cost to homeless and low-income families. Um, and currently, for every dollar of funding we receive, we're able to provide nearly four dollars of dental services. The entire community is positively affected by our effort. As children's oral health is restored and maintained, their overall health improves, school attendance increases, their self-confidence grows, and adults experience similar outcomes. For many, their ability to obtain and maintain employment increases dramatically, um, and their overall outlook on life becomes increasingly positive. The impact of a healthy smile cannot be overestimated. Um, Salt Lake City has been a gracious supporter and sponsor Time. of Salt Lake Donated Dental Services programs, and we're grateful for your generosity. We're looking forward to continuing our partnership during the next year. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Kim Correa will be speaking to, to CDBG, page 6, number 14. Hello again, I'm Kim Crea, the Executive Director of The In-Between. Um, the In-Between um, is a partner with Salt Lake City. We support the police and fire emergency services by reducing unnecessary 911 calls and by placing people that they identify through their um, Community Connection Center and other outreach efforts. Um, this saves the city lots of money while freeing up scarce resources for true emergencies. The in-between also plays a critical role in our new resource center model by meeting the unique and specialized needs of people um, experiencing homelessness who are terminally ill or medically frail, uh, again alleviating the burden of the three new resource centers of having to um, shoulder that responsibility for folks that they're not really prepared to handle. Um, our program, as you know, expanded last June when we moved to the East Liberty Park area. And um, the funding that we requested is critical in order for us to fully um, staff our home, to operate our home uh, to, the, to the best possible extent to meet community need. Um, so therefore, with all due respect to the mayor, um, I, and on behalf of the people that we serve, I would ask that um, you please support the CD, CIP's board of funding recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Minkovich, he will be speaking to several items. CDBG, page 6, number 15, page 7, 16 through 18. ESG, page number 10, uh, uh, page number 9, 3 through 5, 10, number 6, page 11, number 6, and home, page 13, number 3. <clears throat> Thank you, and I will keep my comments focused on those uh, items that have a recommendation attached to them. So first of all, good evening. 
I want to thank each and every one of you for your service to our community. No easy task, I understand that. I want to thank the mayor and I want to thank the Community Development and Capital Improvements Program Board for their volunteering their time and making their recommendations, as well as the Housing Trust Fund Board uh, that serves in a volunteer capacity and the staff that supports them. I also want to take, thank our fellow agencies that are here tonight because so much of what we do at the road home requires the help of others. The Volunteers of America helping to provide additional case management to women in our shelter who would otherwise go without that case management. First Step House is providing thoughtful treatment to men in our shelter who otherwise were going without. And you are helping us. You're helping us with this funding for people who are turning to us and, and coming in and for whom we're providing refuge from the street. But it doesn't end there. You're also helping us to provide rental assistance to help expedite the departure of people out of homelessness and into housing. That's critically important. You're also helping us to provide case management services to people once they've moved out to help them to stabilize and not to return to shelter. So you're at the front door of the shelter, you're at the exit door of the shelter, you're helping to provide services within the shelter, and you are helping the people out in the community who have moved out of homelessness and into housing. Last night we had over a thousand people in our shelters, but we have more people and more children in housing, thanks to your support, than we do in shelter. Thank you all. Thank you. Janita Emerson will be speaking to CDBG, page 7, item number 19. Have to be tall. Hello, my name is Janita Emerson. I am the Chief Operating Officer of 4th Street Clinic. Thank you for your time tonight. I wanted to take this time to address some of the concerns that were raised uh, regarding the continued funding for the MOST program. It was noted that 4th Street Clinic has audit findings from the past two years. Two years ago, we did change auditing firms after having been with the same firm for six years. This change also corresponded with updates to changes to the OMB guidance regarding management of federal funds. And we've worked closely with our auditors to address concerns raised during the audit process. While we do have audit findings, none are material or related to the misuse or fraud of funds. In addition to this, we are implementing a new financial management system, improving our ability to report on a timely basis. An additional concern that was raised was related to staffing changes within the organization. From 2015 through 2017, we did experience a shortfall in qualified medical staff. As a result, the organization needed to prioritize services at the clinic, forcing us to scale back programming in other areas, including the MOST program. In 2017, the clinic hired a medical director who has implemented a recruitment and retention program, hiring four individuals, all of who remain on staff. Finally, concerns were raised regarding the clinic's ability to fully utilize the funds. Spending from 2016 through 2017 was impacted by the provider shortage. During this time, the clinic relied on volunteers who we do not bill for to sustain the MOST program. Since becoming fully staffed in 2018, the MOST program has resumed operations and the clinic is on track to fully utilize the funds allocated in this current funding cycle. Over the past 11 years, MOST has appreciated the support from Salt Lake City funds. The 40,000 requested for MOST provides invaluable medical care and support services for our most vulnerable, those living in camps, motels, not seeking services. Many of those served by MOST are mentally ill, have a substance use disorder, or are victims of human trafficking. In the last six months, MOST has served over 125 Time. unique individuals, many whom will not receive services if the funding is not continued. We truly value our partnership with the city, and we look forward to many more years working together. We urge you to reconsider funding for the MOST program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, so prior, before you leave, can uh, I have some questions um, for okay. you. Can I get your contact information yep, from absolutely. staff? Okay, Amberly Phillips will be speaking to CDBG, page seven, item number 20. There's also one under e ESG as well. Well. I'll be speaking to both. You do, you will be speaking to that as well. ESG, page 10, number eight. 
So hello, I'm Amberly Phillips. I'm the Chief Development Officer at YWCA Utah. I'd like to start by thanking um, the board and the mayor for the favorable recommendation for the YWCA's Women in Jeopardy program. Um, one in three women in Utah will experience domestic violence in her lifetime, and domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness in our community, as well as an important sub subpopulation um, and a priority target population um, for this project. And we are great, while we are grateful for the funding um, recommendation for our Women in Jeopardy program, which annually serves over 800 moms and kids who are fleeing domestic violence, 45% of those whom are from Salt Lake City, we hope and urge you to reconsider our funding application for our transitional housing program. These women are um, also homeless and transitional housing. We have 48 units, um, 197 women and children are able to stay on our campus for up to two years. And that's really where, as one of our program directors always says, the real change happens. It allows them to build lives that are free and safe from violence, uh, free from violence and safe, um, go to school, um, get jobs and live independently for up to two years. And it really is where real transformation happens. So I urge you to reconsider and thank you so much for your recommendation and your support. Thank you. Kathy Bray will be speaking to ESG, page 10, number 7. Good evening. I'm uh, Kathy Bray. I'm the president and CEO for Volunteers of America, Utah. And uh, good evening, council members. and extend my good evening to the mayor and mayor's staff as well. Um, I wanted to uh, remind the council of just the years of support uh, that we've received from the city and thank you for your generosity in so many ways. Actually was um, felt a little sad when I looked at the recommendation of zero for the Homeless Youth Resource Center. and. Um, uh, what I, I guess I'm going to speak from the heart a little bit just around knowing that the city really does support the efforts that we're, we have undertaken to um, offer shelter services to homeless youth 15 to 22 years old in our community. So it just saddens me that we've kind of lost the, the funding connection this uh, time or the recommendations. I, of course, I would say um, please reconsider. Um, I always want to be able to say that Salt Lake City is is financially supporting the Youth Resource Center, and I won't be able to say it next year, but potentially. Um, but we are we're making great strides with homeless youth. Um, we are sheltering about 350 youth a year, seeing 700, and we are uh, moving them into housing as soon as possible. We do not want them to become chronically homeless adults. Um, we're building good relationships with them, employment opportunities, more housing opportunities. We definitely need to keep the shelter operations going. So although it's a disappointment, I do want to thank you for the support that the city has provided to Volunteers of America Utah in so many ways. So thank you so much. Thank you. Patrice Dixon will be speaking to ESG, page 11, item number 4 and 5. Home, page 13, number 1. Hopwa, page 15, number two. I'm Patrice Dixon, I'm COO at Utah Community Action. Let me say first thank you to the mayor's office and staff for the funding recommendations and for the city council for your time and consideration of this funding. Three of our four funding requests were recommended, Diversion, Home TBRA, and Hopwa. Utah Community Action was the first to pilot Diversion in Utah and provide Diversion training throughout the state. Last year, UCA was able to assess 3,086 individuals and divert 952 of those, which is 31% of those pre presenting at the shelter door to other safe alternative options. Diversion eliminates additional trauma for the family or individual, frees up shelter beds, and reduces costs for the community. UCA will be providing diversion services at all of the new resource centers as well as at the Midville Family Shelter. Our HOPA program helped 170 individuals in 90 households in the past year who are homeless or in danger of losing their housing. Utah Community Action requested 162,044 was recommended for 97,393, which is a part of those funds. 
Home and HOPWA funding allows UCA to target the most vulnerable, providing assistance needed for stable housing and self-sufficiency gains. As the recommendations are considered, our rapid rehousing program did not receive funding. This funding helps those who are homeless or facing eviction to maintain their housing. UCA provides assistance outside of the shelters to meet the community need for homeless prevention. Funding would allow us to serve 40 households with holistic case management, rent and deposit assistance for housing stabilization. We appreciate your consideration of our funding requests and the continued support of Salt Lake City. Thank you. Krista Niemczyk, speaking to Hopwa, page 15, item number one. I know I did not do you justice, did I? That's just fine. Um, it's Krista Nimchek. Oh. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm here on behalf of the Housing Authority of the County of Salt Lake, which I am also excited to say is, um, as of last Thursday, doing business as Housing Connect. Um, I am here representing our HOPWA program. Our HOPWA program is Housing Opportunities for Persons with HIV and AIDS. Um, I would like to thank you for your recommendation of HOPWA funds um, for 408000 So with these HOPWA funds, we provide long-term tenant-based rental assistance and housing placement um, assistance for residents with some of the highest barriers to um, housing stability. Those are persons living with HIV and AIDS in our community. 85% of the households that we serve are extremely low income, earning under 30% of AMI. Um, affordable housing means that um, they can afford their rent, they are stable, right? So um, we know that there is a clear link between accessing medical care and um, when, when a household is stable, they're more likely to access that medical care. That is critical. We are saving lives with this housing assistance. Um, we also know, though, that there's not near enough funding um, to support all of the households in need. So as of um, this week, there were 56 households still on the wait list for assistance. Um, that's up from 19 last year. So um, the, need is, uh, the need continues to exist. Our organization partners with um, Salt Lake City as well as Utah AIDS Foundation, um, Utah Community Action, and Clinic 1A. Um, we've partnered for years on this, and um, we are excited to continue that partnership into the coming year. We are, um, we are grateful that with this recommendation, um, we've been able to serve 56 households in the past year um, with this housing assistance, and we will be able to continue housing all of those households, um, in addition to the six who are currently looking for housing. So Time. thank you. Thank you. Jared Hafen will be speaking to Hopwa, page 15, item number three. Good evening, council members, and thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. Uh, my name is Jared Hafen. I'm the programming director at Utah AIDS Foundation. Uh, the Utah AIDS Foundation truly appreciates Salt Lake City's past support. Um, housing stability remains the most vital tool we have in ensuring people living with HIV remain stable in their medical care and adherent to their medications. Uh, the Utah AIDS Foundation appreciates your consideration for continued partnership and thank you for your recommendations. The rest of the comment cards that I have are just general comments. Uh, Kendall Banks followed by George Zamora. Kendall Banks here. All right, George Zamora, followed by Suzanne Arthur. Thank you, consuls. Um, my name is Jorge Zamora. I live in um, West Side of the Silver City for the last 20 years. And um, me and my family, we try to purchase a home in the Salt Lake City, and we find neighborhood works. Uh, they helping us, and the reason we went there is because we don't have the resources to pay the real estate agent or financial agent anywhere, loan, loan officer. And I come here to request um, funds for neighborhood works, um, for affordable housing for uh, um, neighbor and people like me 
residents from Salt Lake City who are looking for place to live for their children. We are, in our family, we have five. I mean, we are five in our family, and um, thanks to Neighbor Wars, we are a place where we can live and um, be safe. Um, we don't want to move from Rose Park, James Rogers from Rose Park. Um, and, but we, instead of living in, in Glendale, we live in Glendale when we came here to Salt Lake City, and we love uh, the hood, Glendale, Rose Park, and I just um, for your consideration to have funds for other uh, immigrants like me, they can have homes, and it's not just immigrants and other uh, people from Caucasians or other uh, people here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne Arthur, followed by Tim Tingey. Good evening, my name is Suzanne Arthur, and I am here on behalf of NeighborWorks and my family. Um, if I walked into neighbor, to NeighborWorks now, I don't think that I would qualify because my income is too high now, which is a good thing. I would expect it to be that way. <laughs> um, but six years ago, March 25th, 2013, I got a house with NeighborWorks. And at that time, um, there were like a lot of predatory loans at that time. And so I didn't, I didn't know where to go, but I knew that NeighborWorks was going to give me a fair deal, and they did. But what I wasn't prepared for was that they were, the, the community building aspect of it. Um, I'm a teacher here in Salt Lake District, and now I live in the neighborhood where my students live. I live where I teach. And my students go to NeighborWorks, even my daughter went to NeighborWorks and got job training through the YouthWorks program there. Um, I, our home has even allowed us to take on foster kids. Sorry. Um, I just want those same opportunities for other families. And I just want to say thank you for supporting NeighborWorks. Well, Tim Tingey followed by Dorothy P. Owen. Council, appreciate this opportunity to speak just for a minute. I'm here on behalf of NeighborWorks, I'm a former board member. I um, have worked with CDBG programs in three different communities. This is the first time that I'm aware in my work that uh, a community uh, that I've worked in in these three different communities in two different states has not awarded CDBG funding to NeighborWorks. Um, they've been a part of your community for 42 years. Um, they do exceptional work and it does not send the right message um, to not continue to partner with them with this important funding that they have for their rebuild and revitalize blight program. There's so much that they can do with these funds that, uh, and their expertise and their exceptional uh, work efforts have impacted thousands of people's of lives in Salt Lake. Um, there's been uh, so much money that's gone towards helping and assisting others. And so I strongly urge that you fund the NeighborWorks um, project, the Rebuild, Revitalize and Blight program, divert some of the funding from the Salt Lake City Corporation HAND program to fund the, these, uh, this important program. It has been communicated that the, the funds, that they, they have these revolving funds and that they uh, work on that revolving loan program and work through that. Um, they will get the funds out and assist and continue this partnership. Once again, 42 years, it's so important to partner with this great organization that's done so much good in your community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dorothy Owen, and I am 
co-chair with Richard Holman of the West Side Coalition. And when I see Richard, I'm going to tell him that his excuse of going to another meeting was fallacious because, you know, he could have been here by now given this meeting, the length of this. So you may be saying to yourself, why would anybody stay in this room for two hours just to come up here and say thank you to you guys? I mean, you know, a lot of the people, I mean, and when you go, having done this process, I used to do be staff for Salt Lake County in this grant allocation process. And as you all know, it's very rigorous. I mean, you go to the commute with the citizens, you go with the mayor, you go to the council. I mean, any rational person would figure out that this is way more work than the, the, the small, relatively small amount of money you get out of it. It's, you know, but they do it. And, and then they stay for two hours so they can say thank you to you, even if you don't give them the money. Why would they do that? And it's because it's not about all about the money. And it took me as staff a long time to figure that out. It's about the relationship. And they know that it's really important to have that relationship with the county, the city, with government in general, because the general public looks at this process. They don't understand all of it, but they understand that it's rigorous. And if you think that taxpayer dollars are uh, well spent with these organizations that the community as a whole can be feeling confident that they can invest their private donations. And that's what this is all about. And from the West Side um, Coalition's perspective, our concern with zero funding for neighborhood works is that it sends this message that somehow in this very tumultuous time where things are changing on the West Side, that maybe the city is Time. pulling back on their commitment. And we know that's not true. And what we really are going to ask you is that in this intervening time, you think about how to strengthen the partnership with Neighborhood Works and how important Neighborhood Works is to helping all the other West Side uh, organizations grow. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm down to my last two comment cards. So if you want to speak, let's get you a raise your hand and we'll get you a card. Uh, Charlotte Fife Jefferson, followed by Mr. Bernie Hart. Thank you, council members and staff. I know it's been a long night, long day. Um, I'm just here as a West Side resident um, in, to speak in support of NeighborWorks Salt Lake. I would respectfully ask that you reconsider the the mayor's recommendation of zero dollars um, this year. NeighborWorks Salt Lake does revitalization and does a lot of what the city does as well, but they do it in a community building way. I think someone said it earlier very well, that they, they are embedded in the community. And so they know, they know what the community needs. Um, you know, over 50% of the board are community members on the west side of Salt Lake City. And they've been, they've been doing this for, since the 80s, um, been committed to our, to our neighborhoods on the west side. So I would just respectfully ask that you continue to support their efforts, and um, that's all. Thank you. Long night. Um, I'm not here to ask for anything. Um, I, I guess I am here to ask for something because uh, what I'm. <laughs> I've heard is uh, all night long is uh, and listen to a lot of people that care and care about other people, care about helping people, would like to do and change the world and really get something done and impact the people that they care about. And there, that is an amazing thing to have that going for us in the city. But I'm going to make a strange request. Uh, not too long ago, the state auditors came down and spent three days with us in our homeless program. 
talking to the homeless individuals to get a feel for what was happening in the system and what was going on. And they weren't there to monitor our program because we take no state funding or we get no city funding. Uh, we're all privately financed. But what we hear from the homeless individuals is their histories. And we're going to be partnering with Salt Lake City or uh, Salt Lake Community College to initiate a study to find out how many people and how often people in the homeless community interacted with social services from the time they were six years old. And I think what we're going to find out is they interacted with the social services and the available services had at least 10 to 25 times to interact with these individuals that ended up on the street homeless. To me, that speaks solely to the effectiveness and the efficiency of the system itself that's put in place to help the kids. And the auditor's job, and when they went through the system, they pointed out that there wasn't many, much proof that anything we were doing was actually helping people. Trying and working hard and caring is a great part of the whole process, but it's only part of the process. It's not, it doesn't speak Time. to results. So I'm asking you with state fu city funding, if you could come up with some kind of auditing system that, that focuses on not money but results, it'd make a number of the people on the street happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hart. The last comment card I have for this evening in regards to the one-year action plan for community development block grant and other federal grants for fiscal year 2019 and 20 is Frank Filatoa. Good evening. Um, grateful for this, uh, this opportunity for the city council uh, team. I um, want to thank uh, Naval Work Salt Lake City, um, Maria Garcia and her staff. I'm one of many stories. Um, they, um, <clears throat> so I guess I'm here to support on their behalf. Um, they actually helped me and my family um, get into a home when times was hard and it wasn't like they just threw me in a home. They were able, we worked uh, close to a year um, and they, they were able to find me a home to be, to be able to accommodate me and my big, my big household that I have. Um, but anyways, to hear that there's no, no more funds uh, being um, granted or, or, or given to Salt Lake City Neighbor Works, it kind of hurts and it, and it hits home. Um, Reason being, it just feels as if um, there will be no more families out there to be able to uh, have that opportunity that I had to to raise my family and to be in a, uh, to have the stability that me and my family have, and um, just being a member of the community that I belong to, which is Poplar Grove. Um, since since being there and hearing the, of the other success stories of uh, Neighbor Works. Um, they really revive the community. It's not like um, it's just something that happens. Uh, there's a lot of successful uh, successful things that come out of Naval Works, and I, I just I'm, I'm here, you know, just to to ask on their behalf that that will, uh, that you guys will be able to continue to help them in funding to to so that they could be able to continue to do what they do. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts. I was here, and yeah. So time. anyways, yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, council members, I'll look for a motion. I move we close the public hearing. Second. Motion by council member Mendenhall. Uh, to close the public hearing and a second by Council Member Johnston. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that motion carries through. Yeah, you're good. Um, we don't have any uh, potential action items this evening. Um, comments to the mayor from the city council. I'm not going to run through it so late evening, but you've got it. The one question I'd have is uh, in regards to the acting city attorney. Do you know when that will be named? 
Sorry, Mr. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Chair, I do not know the timing on that, but I will inquire and get back to you on it. That's great. I do appreciate that. Uh, we're going to jump into the comments to the City Council. I've got three comment cards this evening. The first one is Rex Edgel, followed by Bernie Hart, and then George Chapman. Hi. My uh, comments are going to be a lot like me, short and sweet. Uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, we raised our family in the hood, and we loved it, so it's a good area. Um, so I would like to ask a quick question. Um, how many of you like to save water? This, I wish we could. This is not a, a format for that, but I'm sure we all would love to save water. Okay, very good. <laughs> very good. That's good to know because there's a Salt Lake City ordinance that requires one-third of all residential park strips be green. It's a bad ordinance. It probably is a result of a time back in the 80s when businesses would come in and their parking lots would be all blacktop. And so the city council back there, back then, you know, took the pendulum that was way over here and swung it way over here. And now, well, I mean, we've always had a water problem. And there's really no reason that we should have um, this ordinance. We've been working with Amy Fowler, and we would like uh, to suggest that the uh, city council change this ordinance. It is 21A.48.040. And my friend, Lauren Rudd, received a citation because she didn't have one third, she has two trees, but she didn't have one third of her park strip as green and uh, she said well almost all of my neighbors have the same thing because we all want to save water and the um, the officer said well you don't receive a citation unless someone complains and that seems like a strange ordinance to to just go around and, and arbitrarily pick Time. people to uh, to find and so if there's any way you guys could take care of this ticket for, <laughs> for us, that would be great because it's, it's ridiculous. And we, I hope you'll change the ordinance. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment of personal privilege and say thank you for staying that entire time to let us know how important the, the park strip is to you. So uh, you sat for two and a half hours just to say that for two minutes. So I really appreciate that. Well. I, I would rather the ordinance get, I mean, I, I could stay here all night if this ordinance gets changed. So I hope no. you do it. Huh? <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> so thank you. It, it will get changed, though? Well, if you've got Council Member Fowler behind it, you know it's going to get done. <laughs> right on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bernie Hart, George Chapman. No Bernie Hart? Spirit, I'm sure. <laughs> um, boy, I agree with that. That's a really good idea. Except the Salt Lake City actually has a uh, water conservation person that we were told if anybody gets a citation like that, go to her and she'll work it out. So David Litvak should take the guy's name, contact the water conservation supervisor for Salt Lake City who volunteered to run interference with the ticketing people. Um, I'm here because I want to ask the council and the mayor and the administration to make the uh, new library area safe for pedestrians. The uh, Sprague Library is closing uh, this week and uh, it's going to the new, the old fire station. There's no sidewalks in front of it. And more importantly, there's a curve where the McClellan Trail was, and there used to be planters blocking off the trail from the curve and the road and the traffic, which is really, really dangerous now. The, the planters are gone. They've moved up to help with the Vitek uh, Boulder Ventures project. But those planters are a safety issue. They need to go back. We don't want to have somebody from the Boys and Girls Club uh, run over by, uh, in an accident and it's really, really important you increase public pedestrian safety in that area. Please work on that. Thank you. Thanks, George. 
Uh, no new business. We're on to items, unfinished business items, F1. Uh, resolution for the 2019 municipal election vote by mail interlocal agreement. Look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt a resolution authorizing approval of interlocal agreement between Salt Lake City Corporation and Salt Lake County for municipal election assistance services. Motion by Council Member Wharton, second by Council Member Mendenhall. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that motion carries. We're on to the consent agenda. Just so we're all aware, we're going to be removing item number two, which is the ordinance for 2058 North 2200 West zoning map amendment. So the consent agenda is one, three, four. Those items. So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Council Member Luke, second by Council Member Johnston. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries. Mr. Chair, before yes. you adjourn the meeting. Um, point of personal privilege, I guess. Um, so we did not do the questions uh, to the mayor from the council. Um, because it's so late, let's not read them, but um, if you can give them to he did. David, you did? I'll make sure that he has, you, you have a copy, right? Okay. We're good to go. Thank you. And then we'll follow up at the next formal meeting, or maybe if you could get it beforehand, you know, some questions without the answers. I got a point of personal privilege. Uh, there are two people left from the general public in the build in the room here, and they're both uh, West Side residents. I'd like to point that out. There's four. <laughs> There's four right here too. And this meeting too. Let's keep going for a while. <laughs>